So good morning. Let's get uh, started. Let's get started. Uh, first of all, I'd like again to once more to advertise the aid sheet that we have posted uh, on Quarkus, uh, which includes these uh, position vectors, length elements, surface elements, volume elements for all coordinate systems. If you understand through the examples that we do in class how to use this aid sheet, then you shouldn't be able, you shouldn't have any problems to at least formulate the problem you are trying to solve up to the final integral that uh, we need to evaluate. So I think that uh, once you become familiar with this, uh, you should at least uh, be able to find your way through any types of problems, either in exams or in the textbook or anywhere that involve uh, Coulomb's law as well as the next uh, part, uh, which will be uh, Gauss's law. Uh, so please download this and uh, try to use it as much as possible as well in the lectures to follow examples like the one that I uh, did on Tuesday, on uh, Monday. And uh, I will repeat, uh, discuss a little bit more and conclude today. And that was uh, that of the infinite charged plane. Uh, I have set a coordinate system so that this uh, infinitely charged plane with some constant charge density, rho s sub naught, so this is a constant, is on the xy plane. So before I proceed and review what I did on Monday and uh, do some additional discussion, any questions? Any questions? Yes, please. So if it was a finite plane, then simply that integral would have finite bounds and would be more difficult to evaluate. Again, uh, this is a very, uh, this procedure of uh, the four or five steps that we showed is very general up to that integral. Usually because we do examples where we want to work them out to the end, uh, we choose cases where the integral uh, is one known integral that we can provide the formula and evaluate. Uh, but generally, once you have that integral, you can put it in a computer and evaluate the integral numerically. So this is a very powerful method that is being used by software uh, in computational physics to do such calculations. Um, any other questions? Okay, so uh, this is the case. The observation point was on the z-axis, coordinates 0, 0, z. And um, as you... Remember the first uh, step in this solution was to choose the coordinate system which was the Cartesian because uh, this one is just a, a rectangular plate, if you wish, that is charged. So it makes sense to use the Cartesian coordinate system. Then the second uh, step is to split the distribution or visualize or analyze the distribution as a superposition of point charges and find how would this point charge look like. So here we have a plane. It is actually the xy plane. So if you go to the, it, and it is a, a charge distribution ds. So if you go to the aid sheet, you will see that in Cartesian coordinates, there are three differential surface elements, dx dy, dx dz, dz dy. But here we have fixed z. This plane is a z equals zero plane. And therefore, the two elements that include dz are zero. They are not relevant. So the ds that is relevant here is dx dy, which corresponds to a differentially small area right here. And that area uh, is dy dx. And of course, because there is a uniform surface charge density, this area holds charge. And the charge in that area is dq, rho s, dx, dy. But remember that we assign prime coordinates to these points. So if I want to assign a coordinate here, and this is an arbitrary point on the xy plane, I will say the coordinate is x prime, y prime, zero. So it is on the 
z equals zero plane. And remember, I have to separate the coordinates of the sources and the coordinates of the observation points because I'm running a superposition over the sources, not over the observation points. The observation point is fixed. And the uh, sources are the ones. So that's why I need to do this bookkeeping that many times uh, is, may seem mind-boggling, but if you think about it, it actually makes a lot of sense because if I have a power line, I want to find the field, I'm the observer of the power line, but then the coordinates along the power line need to be, uh, to be changed and um, basically swept along the power line so that you find the superposition of the fields that each segment of the power line creates to the fixed observer. So we have to do this separation and that's why I will put here dx prime dy prime. Then I'm asking what is the field that this uh, point charge now will generate at the observation point. This is now a possible calculation because Coulomb's law is talking about point charges and we have found from Coulomb's law the field of a point charge. Remember fundamentally electric field and that goes all the way to microwaves, uh, millimeter waves, terahertz waves like the terahertz waves that are being used to image us when we, we go through security these days at the airports. Uh, Fundamentally, electric field is force per unit charge. And uh, the electric field now for this dq at the observation point is equal to, this dq now is rho s dx prime dy prime for pi epsilon naught. Remember this constant, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught is 9 times 10 to the 9th. And then we have the position vectors. So the position vectors of the um, observation point R. So again, here you refer to the aid sheet when uh, we are using here rectangular coordinates, Cartesian coordinates, so you can find the position vector and you simply apply it for this particular case. We have 0, 0, z. So observation point. 0 x hat plus 0 y hat plus z z hat. And r prime is the position vector of the point charge of the source dq and that is uh, x prime x hat plus y prime y hat plus 0 z hat. So it has only two components and if I want to find the magnitude of this r minus r prime vector which is a distance vector so if you want to visualize it it is this vector here so we know from Coulomb's law that the electric field at that point will be along the line that connects dq and the observer and pointing outwards not inwards because electric field of because positive charges are sources of electric field lines. So remember the electric field points away from the positive charge and into a negative charge. So what this means, it goes back to the uh, definition of the electric field as force per unit charge. So if you imagine bringing here a positive test charge, what do you expect? Fundamental observable of electricity. It has to repel. It has to feel a positive charge here. It has to feel a repulsive force from the positive charges on the plane. So therefore, this vector cannot be pointing inwards. The electric field cannot be pulling a positive charge to a positive plane. It has to repel a positive charge from a positive plane. So then the magnitude, the length of this distance vector, will be x prime squared plus y prime squared 
plus z squared. So then uh, now I have everything that I need to finalize this expression x prime squared plus y prime squared plus z squared. Three halves. I have one half from the square root and three from this power. And then I have this vector x, x, uh, sorry, the vector r minus r primed, which is z, z hat minus x prime, x hat minus y prime, y hat. Okay, the r minus r prime. So now the last step, or the step before the last, which is the physical interpretation of our result. We have this dx prime, dy prime. The differential elements show you what kind of integral you need to run. If you have not already guessed it from the physics of the problem. So obviously here we have to sweep the charge throughout the plane. So the last step for the calculation at least, before the interpretation of the result, is that the total electric field will come from this integral. Maybe I will just write it here so that I have some space. Uh, rho s, uh, sorry, I called it rho s naught just to indicate that it is a constant. Rho s generally is a surface charge density, so let's uh, put there an additional subscript to uh, make sure we understand this is a constant rho s, uh, one nanocoulomb per meter square or whatever. So the electric field now will be the integral of dE over the entire plane. So we have uh, this bunch of constants, rho s comma naught by 4 pi epsilon naught. And uh, then I have these uh, three integrals. halves, dx prime, dy prime. Okay, so uh, this is, uh, these are integrals over the entire plane where x prime, y prime vary from minus infinity to plus infinity. And uh, we argued last time that these integrals here will be zero because we have a not function of x prime divided by an even function of x prime integrated from minus infinity to plus infinity. So you have an odd function integrated over a symmetric interval that gives you zero. And same thing for this one. So those two will actually give me zero integrals. And that means that the only one that remains to be done is this one. You see both z and z hat are constants. They are not to be integrated. They uh, can be pulled out of the integral. And now inside the integral, uh, we just have dx prime, dy prime, x prime squared plus y prime squared plus z squared, 3 halves. So this is a known integral. I had a typo in my uh, previous lecture. So the result of this is uh, 2 pi divided by absolute value of z. I think in my previous lecture I had uh, missed the pi. So 2 pi over absolute value of z. And then the result is rho s comma 0 by 2 epsilon naught z hat. So we find an electric field that points in the z hat direction. So any questions up to this point, which is the procedure I ran in the previous lecture? Uh, I think he was first. Go ahead. Uh, just one question. Uh, uh, 
why does the x and the y become zero, like x factorial, so the x bar x factorial, x uh, unit vector and y bar y Now what I uh, say here, so the question is again on why I eliminated the integrals. So let me just do it a little bit more in detail. You see this integral here. Okay. Can be split in three integrals. Okay, can be split in three integrals, one for each component. One for each component. So the first component is the z hat. I also take z outside because you see it's not integrated. The integration is done between dx prime dy prime. Remember, z hat is the coordinate of the observer. The observer is fixed. Okay? So z hat z. So this is the integral that we actually ended up evaluating and it had a non-zero result. And then the second one is this one. Okay? So I argue this integral is an integral of a node function. Sorry about that. So this integral is an integral of a node function of x prime over a symmetric interval. Odd function over a symmetric interval. That is a zero integral. So that will come from this first integral over dx prime. And the same thing happens for the next one. Okay. Y prime, dx prime, dy prime. So when you go and integrate y prime, dy prime, divide by this. Let me just write it out so that you see it a little more. So look at this integral, the first of the two. y prime dy prime divided by this. Odd function of y prime divided by even function of y prime. The ratio gives you an odd function of y prime. You integrate it from minus infinity to plus infinity, it gives you zero. That's about it. Um, so these two are zero, and that's why you eliminate them. Uh, yes, please, go ahead. Uh, because I want to emphasize that this charge density is a constant. So if you wish rho s, the charge density is rho s comma zero. That is a constant. Yes, constant. It's constant throughout the plane. Five nanocoulombs per meter squared. One nanocoulomb per meter squared. Constant everywhere on the plane. So that's the point. So this is the math, really. Uh, but, again, uh, we need to make sure that this result makes sense. So what we find here is that if you have this charged plane, the electric field points like this, normal to the plane, and it is actually constant, constant throughout space. Obviously, this constant value is a side effect of our non-physical assumption that we have an infinite plane. For a finite plane, like the charged plane of a capacitor, the electric field would be constant close away from the edges and then would decay with distance uh, away. We'll uh, get to this in a bit. But before I get to this, let me comment again on the direction of the electric field in the z direction. Is that something we could have guessed? So mathematics aside, and that is really important for me that, uh, of course, one can run the integrals and find where the electric field points. But could we have guessed, based on what we know, where the electric field points so that we don't even care about the rules of the integrals uh, with respect to x and y. Yes, you have an idea. We can, we can take a symmetric point charge at the other side and then the z, uh, the uh, x and y coordinates are going to answer. Exactly. So the physics of the problem 
is that if you look at this infinite charge, uh, charged plane, and you have an observation point, 0, 0, z, take this uh, point charge that we considered, this dq. That creates an electric field like this. Well, guess what? Because we have an infinite and not a finite charge distribution, no matter where is that dq, there is a symmetric dq, like this one here, that will create, so this triangle will be an isosceles triangle, will create an electric field of the same magnitude but different direction so that the superposition of the two points in the z direction. So by this argument, I would expect indeed that the electric field would indeed point in the z direction. So you see the x uh, components or y components, uh, depending on where you take this uh, symmetric charge, all the components that are not along the z-axis would actually cancel out. So this is something that we can see from the physics of the problem. Another feature of our result is that it does not depend on x and y. So here is a question. What if this observation point was not on the z-axis, exactly, but it was at a point here, let's say. So, uh, 2, 3, z, something like this. So what, I, what if I move my observation point, the observation point stays at the same height, same z-coordinate, but then moves x and y. Imagine a small drone that has a fixed height with a controller and then changes only its x and y coordinates. Would the field change? No, no because it's like uh, flying over Midwest. You see corn uh, underneath the plane. Uh, so you don't, nothing changes in terms of the sources. So here, if you move your observation point, it would see no change with respect to the sources. And therefore, it doesn't see any change with respect to the effect of the sources, which is the field. Of course, we would suspect that maybe the electric field would change with height from the plane. That would make a lot of sense. But because we have an infinite plane, this actually does not happen either, and we have this uh, constant electric field magnitude. So that, is, uh, the, that completes the calculation. Any questions? Any other questions? Yes? Um, let's say the, like the volumetric density was not constant. Yes. Uh, then would we just have it as part of the integral? Well, if uh, the density wasn't constant, it would be inside the integral, and then I would go to MATLAB uh, or Mathematica and do the calculation, right? Okay, so let me uh, uh, finish this example with one more note. Or two more notes, in fact. So uh, now I'm note three. So what if, what if uh, the plane wasn't positively charged, but negatively charged? So minus, minus, minus. So what would be the field? You see, nothing would change in our calculation. We would simply arrive in an electric field 
that is, uh, can, I, can I have your attention please? As you may learn in communication systems, uh, capacity, that is information rate, bits per second per hertz, is proportional to logarithm of uh, signal to noise ratio. So therefore, as the noise uh, increases, um, and my signal can only increase that much, I already use a microphone, my information rate uh, will decrease necessarily. That's uh, Shannon's theorem. So going back now to electromagnetics, and electricity in fact, I would say that in this case, if the plane was negatively charged, the electric field would be pointing towards the plane because what we have learned already is that uh, the uh, negative charges are sinks of um, uh, electric fields. So we would see the electric field lines sinking. Going back to our original example, what would be the electric field underneath, that is, at negative z's? Yes? It will be going upwards. That's right. Uh, if you notice here, I have this absolute value of z. So the electric field actually changes polarity on this downside of the plane. And likewise, here, if the plane was negatively charged, then the electric field would go like this. Okay. So same value. Same magnitude, rho s naught by 2 epsilon naught, however, the direction uh, changes. So then, something very interesting happens when you bring in a positive and a negatively charged plane. Like uh, what happens in a capacitor, where you have the combination of a positive and a negatively charged plane. I don't need to, I don't need to solve this system again. Superposition still holds, so I will go and apply superposition for, and I may need a little bit more space for this. So my question here is electric field in a capacitor. So imagine this is a z-axis and I bring in at z equal h a positively charged plane. Uh, and uh, let's consider that this plane is similar to the one we just solved. That is, it is infinitely, it infinitely extends on the xy plane, so in the xy directions. So I don't really bother to take finite dimensions for this plane. So as we saw now, the electric field will be like this. constant, in fact, equal to rho s by 2 epsilon naught in terms of magnitude. Now I bring in a negatively charged plane at z equal 0. So let me just go here, z equal 0 and bring in a negatively charged plane. Like this. Again, of infinite extent in the x and y direction. So as you see, I formed a capacitor. So now the electric field lines from this negatively charged plane will look like this. So I'm trying to draw the arrows to have 
all the same length because as we just saw, the magnitudes of those fields will remain constant throughout space. So what do we observe here? Yes. So you see, not inside the capacitor. So inside the capacitor, the fields point in the same direction. And they, in fact, reinforce each other. So you have, on this side, rho s by 2 epsilon naught times 2, rho s by epsilon naught. And then, in all other parts of space, we actually have a cancellation of those two fields. So applying superposition, you find out that this capacitor, as you would expect, because uh, we have considered infinite plates, right? So we expect that those infinite plates would shield the electric field inside. They would act uh, like a sort of a Faraday cage where you have uh, basically enclosed the electric field inside the cage and nothing leaks outside. Uh, so you add those two and indeed that's what we see that happens. And we have the electric field pointing from the positive plate to the negative plate. Uh, that is uh, probably a result you have uh, seen before. And in terms of the electric field expressed in this coordinate system, you see that the electric field lines point in the minus z direction. And they come from the superposition of the two plates individually. So they are, the total electric field is rho s by epsilon naught again. When we get to materials, we will start playing with the material in between the plates, but for now uh, I have uh, simply vacuum. So epsilon not the dielectric permittivity of vacuum. Everything we've done so far is about vacuum. And uh, that will be the electric field in terms of the constant charge density. And uh, let me add my sub naught here. So here we have a constant charge density rho s sub naught here a minus rho s sub naught. So positive and negative charge. And of course this is under the assumption of infinite plates, which from an engineering point of view simply means that you are very far away from the edges. So even if you have a printed circuit board, this assumption actually holds tremendously well. We can see that in uh, electromagnetic simulations. And indeed, if you have, uh, let's say, a printed line on a substrate, then the electric fields will be like this, away from the edges. And then they will start fringing, as we say, away from the edges, going like this. Always following the rule that electric field starts from positive charges and sinks on negative charges. However, if you are away from the edges, you see an observation point like this doesn't see the edges, so perceives that plane as infinitely extending in X and Y, and therefore the electric field is approximated fairly well by this uh, constant magnitude approximation that we derived. I think uh, you guys have a question, and you just debated, uh, yes, so uh, maybe I can help. Uh, sorry, which one is rho? I have here rho okay. sub naught. Yeah. Okay, so is that, is that for the top plate alone? Or is that for... So I try to use green for the positive. Uh, sorry, uh, yellow for the positive and uh, green for the negative. I don't know if the colors uh, show up, but uh, that was the intention. So the green lines are for the negatively charged plane. If you have any doubt, or if I have a typo in my notes, think about the basic rule. The lines will just sink on negative charges and will emanate from positive charges. So, 
Sometimes I'll be making mistakes, but the so uh, but uh, the this basic rule always can help you navigate. So you see the positive charges are here. So the yellow field lines will always point away from the positive charges. Yes, uh, so this is for the yellow and there is another rho s by 2 epsilon naught in terms of magnitude for the negative. Right? So it's what we just calculated. Yes? Can you go over the fact where you were showing like when two plates are uh, like in parallel to one another, the edges splits up or gets the one Well, you see, to, to get this pattern, and I can uh, show you more in next lecture, you need a full simulator. I'm just saying that once you get close to the edges, these lines will not be perfectly perpendicular, will get distorted. So now how you find that, that's a different story. Yes, please. So does the field between the plates depend on the distance between the plates? So as you see here, as far as you are uh, away, uh, away from the edges, are you talking about this example? Yeah, so here it will actually be so as long as the plates are infinitely, like, wide, if the surface is infinitely wide, the field is not dependent on the surface. That's right. And one more thing. Does the, the presence of one charged plate affect the charge density on the other plate? So here we have, uh, that is a very good question. Here we have this scenario where we have constant charge densities on the two plates that are not affected from each other, right? Uh, so. Another question that I would ask is, how can this even exist? How can this even exist? Right? Why don't the plates collapse? And you know from your circuit labs, because you may have this, uh, in, you, you may have a dielectric in between, or you may have a circuit that holds the plates together. Uh, and therefore, if you imagine that this charge density somehow comes to exist, we don't discuss this now, we will discuss it eventually, but you can imagine that this comes to exist because it is connected to a voltage source, and therefore the voltage source controls tightly what will be the charge distributions. So practically, this scenario is very much realistic, just like you've encountered it uh, in, even in high school as the regular operation of a capacitor with plus Q and minus Q. Okay. Yes, we will talk about potential difference, but uh, so let's take it one by one. Uh, by the way, this electrostatic attraction uh, between plates is the way that microelectromechanical switches, components that we have now in cell phones and health monitors and so on, work. So you just uh, activate the switch by activating a voltage source that charges the two plates, and then the two plates collapse and close the switch. You take the voltage away, then the switch comes off. Uh, so, uh, very interesting to ask uh, how, how come this exists anyway, so there, is, oh, there, there has to be a way to counteract this uh, attraction between the plates. Alright, uh, so we have uh, calculated quite a few electric fields and uh, we'll be doing more examples along the way. But uh, I would also uh, like to now move to the, sec to the next uh, topic and make a note that the electric field satisfies some fundamental equations. Your textbook starts from those and calls them Maxwell's equations for uh, electrostatics, and um, they are both referring to closed structures, the first one on a closed surface, the second one on a closed path. So the electric field, or the electrostatic field to be more precise, because we're talking about electric fields from point charges, satisfies, first of all, Gauss's law, And Gauss' law says that if you take a closed surface,
So this is uh, a closed surface. Uh, I drew an arbitrary closed surface. It could have been a closed cylinder. It could have been a sphere. So these are non-arbitrary closed surfaces. It could have been a box, a rectangular box. Okay, so it doesn't have to be any specific shape. Uh, it can be arbitrary, but these are shapes that you can visualize a little bit better. And closed means not in the sense of the mathematicians of the closed interval versus an open interval. Closed surface means if you imagine that there is a bug trapped inside the surface, it cannot leave the surface unless it pokes a hole somehow or you poke a hole yourself to let it out. So that is uh, the sense of the closed surface that we have here. And Gauss's law says that if you take this surface integral through the surface of the electric field, and what we call here ds is the differential surface element. Again, I point you to the uh, aid sheet where we have the differential surface elements, ds, uh, for different coordinate systems. So you can imagine that you draw a small patch of surface on this surface and this ds points outwards. So this is uh, a vector that points outwards. We call this integral a flux integral uh, because uh, you see we have here this dot product uh, between the electric field and ds. So imagine, for example, that you had uh, this cylinder here. The ds on the top of the cylinder would be this. And imagine the electric field lines were like this. E dot ds would in this case be zero because the dot product between two perpendicular vectors is zero. And you see indeed these lines don't cut the top. So E dot ds zero is E dot ds is a measure of the flux of these electric field vectors through a given area. And it can be uh, large, it can be small, it can be positive, it can be negative. Remember that uh, when you have the dot product between two vectors that point in the same direction, this is positive. And if they point in different directions, the dot product is negative. So dot product is always a scalar, it maps two vectors to a scalar quantity that can be zero, positive, negative. And uh, it is negative when the two vectors are perpendicular. Let me just point uh, at this case here. Positive if they point in the same direction and negative if, uh, they, uh, and negative if they point in different directions. So Gauss says that if you do this dot product, this will be equal to the charge Q inside the surface so the total charge inside the surface Q enclosed so that charge would be supported within the volume, let me call this volume V, uh, that is defined by this closed surface. And let me give you an example where this law becomes very easy to understand. And that example is the case of the point charge.
point charge at the origin of a coordinate system. So this is our charge. It's at the origin. Let's take it as positive charge Q. And we know that the electric field of this charge would be given by this general formula. But now our prime, which is the position vector of this point charge, is zero because I put the charge at the origin. So x prime, y prime, z prime are all zero. Right? So therefore, this is zero here. And the electric field becomes Q by 4 pi epsilon naught R cubed R. So if I am at this observation point with position vector R, that is the field that I will measure. And then we can, we can express this R in terms of the unit vector in the spherical coordinates, the unit vector R hat. So this uh, position vector R is R R hat. Again, you can find this in the aid sheet, first line for uh, the, uh, the uh, spherical coordinate system. So that is Q by 4 pi epsilon naught R cubed, R R hat. And that's where now R and R uh, cubed cancel out and we have Q by 4 pi epsilon naught R squared R hat. All this known from before about the point charge. So now, uh, given that this point charge creates these lines that are radially outwards from the charge, I can apply Gauss's law instead of picking a surface that is arbitrary, it makes sense now that I have a field that is spherically symmetric to choose a sphere. So Gauss's law says no matter what, the, the law will hold, no matter what surface you pick. But for my convenience, I can take a sphere. So I will apply the law on a sphere of radius R. Okay. So what is the DS for that sphere? Again, if you go to your aid sheet, you will see that there are three DSs uh, for the spherical coordinate system. Two of them contain dr in front of them. dr uh, vectors cannot be the appropriate elements for the sphere because the sphere has a fixed r. So everything that contains dr in that list is zero on the sphere. The sphere is a shape that you define by fixing this radius r. So the only vector that does not have a dr in front of it is this vector here. d theta d phi. And this is really a vector that you can visualize as a small area on the sphere and uh, the vector pointing outwards. So now if I form this flux integral, You see, I take the dot product between the unit vector R and itself. Dot products between unit vectors are equal to 1 if you take a dot product between a vector and itself. 
and zero in all other cases. Uh, when you uh, take uh, dot products between unit vectors in an orthogonal coordinate system, there are these two cases. It's either one or zero. And then we have R squared sine theta d theta d phi. So R squared and R squared cancels out. We have Q by 4 pi epsilon naught constants. And inside an integral 0 to pi sine theta d theta. 0 to 2 pi d phi. So I scan all the angles in the sphere. So this one is 2 pi. This one is 2. And those cancel out. And the result is indeed, as Gauss's law says, Q divided by epsilon naught. Because in this case, your enclosed charge is just this point charge. This is easy to calculate. But what is remarkable about Gauss's law is that Gauss says, no matter which surface you had picked to do this calculation, you would find actually the same thing. The output would be still Q over epsilon naught. Not a very intuitive result, but still one that holds a powerful uh, law. So I'll stop here for today. Thanks for your attention. I'll stick around for questions and see you tomorrow. <laughs>